Hello, everyone. Uh, this week's topic is called capacitors. Capacitors are a type of uh, device you can find in most uh, electronics, most circuits. Um, and in order to talk about how they work, we have to think back a little bit to electrostatics, which was a few chapters back. Um, so the things I want to remind you about from electrostatics are about the way electric fields work and the way electric fields are related to electric potential or voltage. So first reminder is that electric fields um, radiate away from positive charges and toward negative charges. So if you're drawing field lines, which is the most convenient way of illustrating fields usually, uh, those lines come out of positively charged objects and then they disappear into negatively charged objects. The units that we used for measuring electric field, uh, there were two choices. You could do Newton's per coulomb, which emphasizes that the field tells you how much force is exerted on charged particles. But you can also measure electric field in units of volts per meter. And that perspective emphasizes the relationship between the electric field and the potential. So to talk a little bit more about that, because obviously potential or volts is pretty important in circuits, uh, electric field always points in the direction of decreasing potential. So electric field points downhill if you want to think of potential as being analogous to altitude or height, uh, which is a helpful analogy to make. If you want to think about potential as being like a height, electric field points downhill. Uh, <clears throat> therefore, that means that if you are moving in the direction of the electric field, the potential needs to decrease because the field points downhill. And mathematically speaking, the relationship between the field and the potential um, involves a slope. Technically, it's a gradient, which is like a vector quantity, but uh, we can think about it just in terms of the slope. So like if you take delta V over delta X, change in potential over some distance, uh, that's like calculating a slope. And throw in a minus sign for the direction to make sure that the electric field points downhill instead of uphill. Um, in circuits, we're mainly interested only in the magnitude of a potential difference. So the minus sign, uh, we're not going to worry about most of the time, in this chapter at least. But that's the, that's the way they're related to each other. Position or distance voltage or potential, and the electric field. So, <clears throat> uh, I know there's a lot of lines on these diagrams, don't worry. Uh, what I've got in the top diagram is a large, positively charged plate. Um, and the electric field lines for a big flat object like this, near the edges, they'll sort of like curve off. But if you're looking at this region near the middle of the plate, field lines are going to be pretty straight and evenly spaced, which means that the field near the middle of the plate is uniform, or at least close to being uniform. This is actually true near the surface of any, or near any flat charged object. So like if I had a cube and you were very close to one of the faces of the cube or something like that. The field will look uniform there also. If it's a curved surface, like if you're near the surface of a sphere, then it's not going to look uniform because the field lines are definitely spreading out as they move away from the sphere. Although I suppose if you got super close, like if you got as close to the sphere as we are to the Earth's sphere, the field will look pretty uniform then. Uh, like if the sphere is as big as the Earth, I guess is what I'm saying, then the electric field near the surface would look pretty uniform if you're that close. But that's very, very close. 
Anyway, regardless, um, if you're close to the surface, or if the plate is large enough, the field is going to look uniform. Um, so if you have two plates that are opposites of each other instead of just the one, I have a positive plate and a perfectly opposite negative plate. In this case, uh, since the total charge in the diagram is zero, that means all of the field lines need to connect. That was one of the rules that we had when we were studying fields before. In the top picture, all the lines just go off into space and they never come back because there's nothing for them to connect to. But in this bottom picture, all of the lines have to wrap around and connect. And so what that gives me is a very strong field in the region between the plates. It's kind of like a little bit curvy on the ends, and that's referred to as fringing because it's not uniform there. And then if you look off in the space um, away from the plates, or like above or below them so that you're not in between. The field is extremely weak there, effectively zero. So it allows you to make a small concentrated region with a strong electric field. So <clears throat> a device like that is called a capacitor. The sort of canonical model of a capacitor is with these two close metal plates. As soon as you connect them to a battery, current is going to flow for a little bit. It can't flow um, like continuously because obviously there's a gap there. And we said before that you need to have a complete circuit in order for current to flow. Um, but current will flow for a very short amount of time until it sort of bunches up on a plates. And at that point, the plates have as much of a potential difference as the battery does. Um, and then things no longer flow. And in a secondary video, I'll, I'll play around with some simulations. This illustration here is from one of the simulations I'm going to show you. But you can see that I have a battery. Um, the positive end is on top. And so some current has flowed out of the battery and reached this top plate. And the top plate is marked as being positively charged. Similarly, the bottom plate is marked as being negatively charged. You can think of that as either being because current flowed away from that plate into the bottom of the battery, or you can think of it as that this positively charged plate has attracted a bunch of electrons, um, and so some electrons have bunched up on the lower plate. Either way, the plates end up with opposite charges. And there's an electric field indicated here, too, with all these arrows going between the plates. So there's a certain amount of potential difference here, a certain amount of voltage, and it's going to match the battery's voltage. And there's a certain amount of charge on the plate. So if you take that charge Q, you divide it by the voltage V, that is the quantity that we call capacitance. And that's the primary characteristic of any capacitor. Similar to with a resistor, we talk about the resistance of the resistor based on how much it resists uh, the flow of current. With a capacitor, we talk about the capacitance. And that tells us how much charge is required for a certain amount of volts, coulombs per volt. Now, that the unit for capacitance it has its own name. It's called the farad or farad. Uh, the symbol for that is an F. It's named after Michael Faraday, who hopefully recognize that name from our magnetism units. Um, and most capacitances are much smaller than one farad. So you can see a lot of microfarads, nanofarads, picofarads, even. Um, and that's for the same reason <clears throat> as with uh, charges, for example. You don't see a lot of objects with a charge of two coulombs, because a coulomb is a lot of charge. Uh, so most of our charges were always in like micro or something like that, and farads are going to have the same sorts of prefixes on them. So <clears throat> again, this is the definition of capacitance, and it's based on the way the device operates. 
But you can also describe the capacitance in terms of the physical characteristics of the capacitor. Depends on the plate area A. Depends on the distance between the plates D. And it also depends on what you put in between the plates. So like in this diagram here, there's just nothing there. It's like air or vacuum or something. But you can put stuff in between them. And I'll get to that more on another slide. Um, and so there's this electrical property called the dielectric constant. So for whatever substance you put in there, it depends on that too. And those things are related through this formula. Now you may remember with resistors, <clears throat> we had definition of resistance, which was V over I volts per amp. But then we also had a formula for resistors about like how long is the resistor, how wide is it, what's the resistivity of the material it's made of. So those two separate resistor equations are very similar to these two separate capacitance equations. One of them is about how it works. The other one is about how it's like made physically. All right, <clears throat> so if you charge up a capacitor by connecting it to a battery, you've got those uh, charged plates and oppositely charged objects attract each other. So I have this positive and this negative right here close to each other. There's gonna be a force trying to pull them together. And if I hold them apart, or if I like to pull them further apart, um, that's going to require work. It means that there's energy stored there. There's a potential energy. Just like if you hold an object up above the ground, you have gravitational potential energy in that case because the object is attracted to the Earth. And here with the capacitor plates, there's potential energy stored there too. So there is a way to derive this first formula potential energy equals half times charge times voltage. That can be derived, but you kind of need to use calculus for it. It's based on the electric potential energy formulas that we studied uh, back in electrostatics. But there's not really a, there's not a good way to do it without calculus. So I'm just going to give it to you uh, and ask you to trust me that I'm not lying about it. But given that formula, and the definition of capacitance, which also involved Q and V, you can make some substitutions and get these two other forms for the potential energy. So you can write it in terms of whichever two variables uh, you want <clears throat> between the capacitance and the voltage and the charge. And again, that is similar, very similar to something we had with resistors, where you could write the power of a resistor in three different forms, depending on how you substituted in the uh, resistance definition. So there's a lot of parallels between these, and you'll see even more of that next week. All right, <clears throat> so about putting stuff between the plates. If you put some material in between the plates, uh, it has to be an insulating material. If I put like a chunk of metal in here, then the current is just going to flow through it. And then I just have a silly looking wire instead of a capacitor. So it's got to be some kind of an insulator like plastic or paper, um, something, you know, an insulator. But when you put an insulating material in an electric field, that material always becomes polarized. And that, again, is something we talked about a little bit back in electrostatics. So in my diagram here, I have the positive and negative plates in blue. And then I filled this gap between them with some gray substance. And because the top plate is positively charged, that means that the insulator, the dielectric, is going to become slightly negatively charged on the top surface. And similarly, slightly positive on the bottom. So the electric field that I had there before is going to be partially canceled out. Uh, you can almost think of like this, uh, these scattered minus signs here. It's almost like they, they effectively cancel out some of the pluses um, from the plate. 
And so like the effective uh, charge or the total electric field strength is going to be decreased. So what that means, if I reduce this electric field E, but I keep the same distance D, that means that the voltage, the potential difference between the plates must get smaller. So when you put in the dielectric, weakens the electric field that was there, and that means that the number of volts between the plates also goes down. So <clears throat> since the capacitance was defined as Q over V, if I keep the same Q but I lower my V, and make V smaller, that means C must go up. And you can see that in this formula here that I showed you before with the plate area and the distance. The dielectric constant K is the number that describes uh, the dielectric. And so when you put it in, that's going to increase the value of C. So K itself is a unitless number. Uh, it's technically defined as like a ratio of two other things. So um, there's no units on it, which is nice. The value of K for a perfect vacuum is 1. And for anything else, the value of K is greater than 1. For air, technically, K is greater than 1, because it's not a vacuum. But it is not a lot greater. Um, you really need, like, a, a solid substance in order to get a, an appreciable K above 1. So pretty much any gas that you put in between plates is not going to do much. Um, so the K for air is so close to 1 that you can just go ahead and use 1. You can pretend that the air is a vacuum, and that'll be fine. But if, uh, if you put some solid substance in there, then you'll have to make use of the K value for that substance. Okay. <clears throat> so... You're going to see some questions in the work um, that involve changing some of the properties, like what if you increase the area of the plates, or what if someone grabs onto the plates and pulls them away from each other, and that sort of thing. Um, and if you do that, it's going to change the capacitance, for one thing, because the capacitance depends on the plate area and on the separation and on the dielectric constant. So if you do anything to mess with those numbers, going to change C. And if you change C, then that means you've also changed the relationship between the charge on the plates and voltage across the device. So if I ask you a question like, what happens when I pull the plates further apart? You know that that's going to affect the ratio between Q and V, but you need more information before you can decide, like, oh, Q is going to go up versus V is going to go down. So you need to know if the capacitor is still connected to its battery, or if it is isolated, floating in space, disconnected from other stuff. So here's a connected to the battery case. And in my second video, I'll, I'll play around with the simulation to show you this. But as long as it's connected to the battery, if I, like, yank on this plate to pull it away from the other one, current can still flow in the wires. Like, if I'm not doing anything, it's going to be in, a, like, a fixed, stable state. But if I mess with the capacitor, I can get more current flowing out of the battery, or I could force some current back into the battery. But the point is that the charge on these plates is not, um, it's not going to be constant. If I make a change... The charge on the plates will also change because as long as it's connected to a battery, then it has to have the same potential difference as the battery. If it's a, I don't know what my battery is set to in this picture, half a volt or something. If it's a half a volt battery, then the voltage for the capacitor has to be half a volt. No matter what I do to the plates, it still has to be half a volt. And that means Q is going to be changing. Now, in contrast, if I disconnect the capacitor, here you can see that the wires coming off the capacitor, they're no longer 
touching the battery. So if I mess around with the plates now for an isolated capacitor, there's nowhere for the charge to go. I can't get any more charge. I can't get rid of any charge because there's just a dead end. So in this case, the Q value will be constant. And that means that V is going to change when I mess around with it. So there's more than one question in the classwork. Um, which gets at this idea. And this is similar, again, to some of the questions I asked you about resistors, where you would have to know for a resistor, um, for a set of resistors, like are they in series with each other or are they in parallel with each other? Because in one case, you knew that the resistors had to have the same current. In the other case, you knew they had to have the same voltage. And before you could decide like what's going to happen to the power consumption, you had to know that. Am I holding I constant or am I holding V constant? Very similar here. So in one case, it's Q that varies, and in the other case, it's V that varies. And so you just need to keep track of that. Oh. My, my dog just head butted the door open. Let's see if I can get him on camera for a second. Rap. Oh, he's not high enough up. There's eager for you. He needs a haircut so badly that uh, he can't really see out of his uh, poodle fro. And he has been walking into things recently. <laughs> All right. So anyway, uh, <clears throat> last slide for this video. So C, and when you're studying circuits, C refers to capacitance. And the definition of capacitance is based on how the capacitor works, the amount of charge per volt. So that's this C equals Q over V. You can also write capacitance in terms of the physical properties of the object. So like how big is it, what's in between the plates. And that's the second formula. So both of those are ways of finding C. The electric field between the plates is going to be uniform. So we can apply this idea about uniform fields that we saw back in electrostatics. The potential difference of the volts has to be the electric field E times the distance D. Capacitors store energy when they are charged up. You can write that energy in any of these forms. So use whichever one is most convenient uh, for a given question. And if you see questions about capacitors being changed in some way or modified, in order to predict what's going to happen, you have to know um, which quantity is being held constant and which quantity is allowed to change. So it'll always be the case that either Q is held constant or V is held constant. And that's just a, a matter of whether it's still connected to a battery or not. And then lastly, I threw in this photo at the end because I realized uh, I hadn't shown what they actually look like. I only showed the, these like idealized models. But these are all real capacitors. If you've ever looked at the inside of a computer or any electronic device, which you probably have, uh, you've definitely seen these things on circuit boards. <clears throat> a lot of them look like little tiny cylinders. Sometimes it's more like a disk or a square. Um, but if you see these things sticking out of a circuit board, that's what they are. They're capacitors for doing timing functions, um, smoothing out fluctuations in current to protect other parts, um, and for temporarily storing energy uh, to release it again later. All right. So that's that. That's it for this one. Like I said, uh, there's going to be a second video 
where I try to illustrate some of these ideas uh, with simulations. Um, yeah. That's it for now.